Hofstra, and um, his mentors were Val Wiesner and myself. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about some characterization work that he's done on some samples that we had flown at Missy. Um, you guys might notice Missy 8, that's a small number. We're up to Missy 20 now, so I've been sitting on these samples for a long time. Um, Jackson's from the University of Texas Arlington, um, and the interesting facts about Jackson, he has one and I have one. So his is that he's moved more times than he's been alive in years, right? So that's moving a lot. Um, mine is that one of the first stories he told me is that he was having car trouble, right? So he went, he decided to go to the grocery store and was going to jog there. And he said it was so hot, if I remember right, like he felt like his shoes were melting. So made me question his sanity, which is how I knew he'd be a great fit for us, right? Sure. So uh, with that, Dax in the floor. Sure. Yeah, thank you very much. You're not the only one who questions my sanity. <laughs> All right, so this is my presentation. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm really excited to uh, give this one. It was about characterizing material responses in space and lunar environments, uh, findings from Missy 8, Missy 16, and lunar dust analysis. So, you know, I've got a lot to go into and not a whole lot of time, so quick introduction. Um, I started off from like a very humble college background. I studied at Northeast Lakeview College, which I'm sure none of you know what that is. It's a small community college in, near San Antonio. Uh, but during that time, I did NCOS, National Community College Aerospace Scholars. And you see that guy in the back? That is right there in the front now. <laughs> this was my mentor back then, and now here he is in my exit presentation. How cool is that? So after I graduated um, in 2020, I got my associates in science and moved to the University of Texas at Arlington, where I'm currently studying aerospace and mechanical engineering. So at UTA, I'm involved in uh, three, I'm involved in a lot of different clubs. Uh, the main three are, first of all, uh, Aero Mavericks, which is the UTA fixed wing flight and rocketry team. I'm also in SACE, which is the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers, and MedLife, which stands for Medicine, Education, and Development. Uh, it's basically a community outreach, leadership, and uh, like charity organization. We do like community service, stuff like that. Then here's just some pictures of uh, day in life when I'm like not chained to a desk doing computer work or school work. Um, right in the middle there is a picture of when we went water rafting with some of the other interns. All right, so present, I am a student researcher here at LARC for OSIM with a focus on material science, specifically MISI and LDA. So that begs the question, what is MISI? Well, y'all had like a brief overview of it earlier. In the simplest terms possible, this was a series of experiments flown outside the ISS to test the performance of materials in space. Um, the typical timeline for these materials was about six months of exposure in low Earth orbit, where the main factors of degradation are atmospheric, atomic oxygen, and solar radiation. So these are the samples we studied for Missile 16. They were launched July 22nd on SpaceX Mission 25 and retrieved on February 2023, SpaceX Mission 27. So our Missy 8, this is them uh, out there on the ISS. Uh, these were launched in May 2011 and retrieved February 2014. Then here's a pretty cool picture I found of uh, astronaut Andrew Fustel replacing the Missy 8 tray on the ISS. So the orientation is very important. So the Missy 16 ones were on the ramp, which is the direction that the ISS is moving, so they sweep up the most uh, atomic oxygen. Um, the Missy 8 samples were on the zenith and nadir uh, orientations, which was mostly about uh, the solar radiation. So essentially the Missy 8 got more solar radiation and the Missy 16 got more atomic oxygen. So some of the characterization methods included optical microscopy, infrared spectroscopy, optical profilometry, contact angle goniometry, and then with the electron microscope we did scanning electron microscope um, for imaging and then energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy, EDS. So these are the characterization uh, materials that we got, uh, including, they're separated into three main groups, Missy 8 polymers, Missy 16 polymers, Missy 16 ceramics. These are all about one inch diameter samples. We got the Missy samples on the top and the control samples on the bottom. So let's go through some of the results. Uh, again, there were way too much data to go over in such a short presentation, so I'm just gonna give a brief overview, uh, starting with optical microscopy. Thought it was really interesting how you could uh, like uh, you saw those uh, images of the trays that they were in. So those retainer rings that held the samples in place when they were exposed to the ISS actually protected the outside ring and the center was exposed. And if you go to those borders, you can kind of see the difference. Uh, I'm gonna use all the Missy 8 samples as an example. So uh, 
This gate put one is the least obvious added with that line there. So you can see at the bottom, that was the part that was exposed to space. The top was uh, protected. This one is a little more obvious. I don't even necessarily need the line, but there it is in case you need help. The top was exposed. The bottom was protected. This one is very obvious. The right side was the exposed part. Um, looks very degraded compared to the left side, which is protected. <coughs> Same here. Um, more to the right was the part that was exposed. Um, here was one of the Kapton samples from Mrs. 16. Half of that had a laser etched uh, crosshatch pattern, which was uh, the case for three of the Mrs. 16 samples. We were testing uh, well, the effects of like the crosshatching pattern that had like protective qualities or, you know, if that would affect how these materials were um, responding to the space environment. So here's LCLR1, which also had the same, uh, you know, crosshatch pattern on half of it, left side on um, top, that's the exposed part. Then the left side on the right hand image is uh, the crosshatch pattern. You can kind of see the ring there too. Um, this was FEP, which also had a, a laser crosshatch pattern. You couldn't really see the ring because it was not, it was a very subtle difference. Um, you could see it visibly with the naked eye, not so much under the microscope. Um, and the crosshatching pattern looked essentially the same. Then the uh, ceramics, uh, we gotta have the control samples on the left, the MISI samples on the right. Um, virtually no visible changes for any of these. The uh, ceramics were pretty inert and uh, low earth orbit. So you can see there's very little difference with any of them. So that takes us to our next method, which was infrared spectroscopy. So infrared spectroscopy measures responsive infrared light based on reflective properties of samples chemical bonds. So you get a specter from these that tells you what chemical bonds are present in the material. And we were trying to see what changed. So most materials actually had identical spectrum with only a few variations. Like for these, you can see almost identical. These um, also, we have some that are identical, some that are only change in terms of the amplitude of the absorbance values um, per wave number. And then as you can see in the top right for the LCLR1 sample that wasn't in laser edge, there were actually a few more differences. Like uh, at about a wave number of 1,000, we can kind of see some of those peaks switching. Um, and I think around that, uh, those wave numbers corresponds to uh, carbon oxygen. So that, that uh, right there is one of the things that jumped out the most. But for the most part, these are all pretty similar, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on these results. Again, very similar. So, moving on to optical profilometry. This is a no contact method that uses light to scan the surface of the material and create a 3D topographical map. So here, I'm just gonna take uh, one example from each of the three batches I mentioned. Um, this is one from the CA polymers. Um, here we have the intensity profile and the topography profile. Here for the chrome carbide, same thing. Oh yeah, by the way, the uh, control samples are on the left and the missing samples are on the right. I don't know if you can see that uh, below the figures. Um, but we saw a little bit of a, a lot more changes or at least it was a lot more obvious under the profilometer. Um, using these scans, we were able to take roughness measurements, like if these roughness values increased or decreased. Um, there was no pattern across all the materials, but each one um, definitely showed changes. Like here's the Missy 8 ones, for example. The red arrow means the roughness values went down after exposure to space. The green means it went up. Um, it varied for every single material. Next was contact angle goniometry. This is a method that you take a small droplet of liquid on a fixed platform and puts uh, on a platform with a fixed uh, stage and camera. And as we rotate this, we use digital or, uh, image correlation to see if the contact angle changed to know about what ability properties of the materials. So here's a couple examples of how it works. Here's the first image, and then the platform is tilted 60 degrees, and then more images are taken, or there's a video taken, but the snapshot at the beginning and the end are the ones that are key. So here you can see how the water drop it like shift a little bit there was a couple times where they actually rolled off. So here we have Kapton from the Missy 16 polymers and then the M8.4 from the Missy 8. A few more examples. Um, there were also way too many results to go through all of them, but they were also material specific like the roughness values. Um, some of them increased in hydrophobicity, some of them decreased. Some of them actually went from hydrophilic to hydrophobic, which means uh, the contact angle is uh, less than 90 degrees, it's considered uh, hydrophilic. If it's greater than 90 degrees, it's considered hydrophobic. Some of them actually went from hydrophilic to hydrophobic. Um, some of them had their hydrophobicity decrease. Um, this is the one for uh, M8.3. This one had the opposite, it went from hydrophobic to hydrophilic. Um, M8.4 had its hydrophobicity decrease. 
Um, and we saw all these different changes. Some of them increased, some of those decreased. Um, some materials transitioned from hydrophobic to hydrophilic or vice versa. Changes in hydrophobicity did not seem to correlate with the roughness values, the roughness changes, or uh, any of the other uh, methods that were mentioned. There seems to be no general solution. In these, uh, for each material, they showed very different um, changes in results after exposure to outer space. So that was the uh, overall conclusion from these past few characterization methods. Then uh, we had electron microscopy. Now, we were only able to do these with the ceramics so far, so I'm gonna go through these results really quick um, with just a couple of example images because I, I don't have time to go through all the images, sadly. But, uh, you know, similar with the, uh, with the optical microscopy, the uh, controls in the MISI samples were very similar for the ceramics. They showed minimal sort of topographical changes or visual changes. Um, PTI 25, which is the second uh, ceramic we study. Um, this one, see, you can see, uh, looks a little bit more different under the uh, electron microscope than PTI 261. Here's a couple more sample images, the uh, control sample on the left and the sample on the right again. So that was uh, what we did for uh, the MISI samples. Um, we also did do uh, EDS, um, collected all this spectra, but uh, it's too much to include in this presentation. We still need to go through a lot of those results, so I'm gonna move on to lunar dust analysis, which is a series of experiments I've designed to analyze lunar, uh, lunar dust. So who cares about lunar dust? Well, there's actually a lot of risk to it, and with uh, NASA having its sights set on the moon with the Artemis missions, this is bumped up in priority. So some of these risks include it's abrasive, it uh, corrodes materials, it's electrostatic, meaning it kind of sticks to everything, and it's actually extremely toxic. It's extremely toxic to inhale, and because the moon has no atmosphere, it's being constantly bombarded by solar radiation. So that means that astronauts can get radiation poisoning from it. Compromises seals and joints with, with the Artemis missions and uh, the moon colony that's gonna be set up. That's gonna be a big problem with all the autonomous robots that are gonna be functioning on there. Um, and then it also has thermal and electrical issues, uh, sensitive equipment. So it is a problem and it's not very well understood. So that is the goal of the LDA experiment is to have a simple, practical, quantitative measure of lunar dust adhesion properties for common materials used in aerospace and space applications. So the uh, experiment I designed for this um, was sort of based off of uh, an earlier form of experiment that was done with the centrifuge and then I kind of took that and uh, here was the process I came up with. First, we take mass measurements of clean samples. They're white clean, so there's no dust, and we get a baseline. Then, step two, they're put in the lunar dust deposition chamber, which uses aeros aerosolization to um, eject the lunar dust into the air. It settles down on top of the material um, in a controlled area, and then that sample is taken and also measured, so we see how much mass it gained with a very sensitive scale. Finally, um, we do centrifuge testing. So we take these materials, put them in a specially designed chuck that's designed to uh, create so that these lunar dust particles only have centr uh, centrifugal force acting on them and airflow around them is discouraged. So what that does is it gives us two main quali uh, quantitative parameters. Um, it's really complicated, so stick with me. They are mass and force. Just kidding, it's not complicated, which is the beauty of this. So um, using the centrifuge, we can use these equations to uh, tell how much force is acting on each particle of dust. Using uh, how far away they are from the center times the angular velocity, we get that uh, tangential velocity. And then using this equation, we put the tangential velocity in there. We can get the force per um, mass, which would be really tiny for each of these particles. But that this is important because what we do is we take those mass measurements and we have a known amount of force that we supply to the centrifuge. And we get something like this when we plot the results. So on the y-axis, this is the mass that was left after centrifugation versus um, the mass that was gained, like how much was deposited on the first place. So this is kind of a ratio to how much was left. And then the RPMs, uh, I did a series of tests on FEP to uh, get this equation. But basically what we found is a linear line is what fits best for uh, this slope. And now notice this y value. That is the uh, mass that's left over the original mass that was deposited. And these are two known parameters. The angular velocity, also a known parameter. The only one that is unknown is that mu, which is 
uh, so far what's being called the lunar dust adhesion coefficient, specific for each material. Um, lunar dust adhesion coefficient is a little bit of a mouthful, so I'm also just going to call it Jackson's coefficient. So let's go back to that map. You see that y um, equals x. So for this one, the uh, lunar dust coefficient would be about 0.002. Um, then it's rotations per minute, so it would be minutes per rotation. It would be the uh, uh, units in this case. But as we saw earlier, it's very easy to switch from RPM to actual force. So this relationship can be used to draw a direct relationship between how much force every particle holds on to a certain material. So basically, um, I did this for nine more materials. Um, this is the uh, mass gained is the purple. The mass that was left after centrifugation is the blue. Um, we did this at 2,000 RPMs. So finally, to wrap this up for Missy. Each material was affected differently by the space environment. The results of each of these materials varied. Um, and these findings are going to contribute to the individual knowledge of each material to use in future applications. For LDA, this was one of the first ever quantitative models for mechanical lunar dust adhesion. Um, very simple, straightforward formula to give you a good idea of how uh, strong lunar dust sticks to a material. More experience will have to be performed to derive reliable um, Jackson coefficients and verify the equation and get those good values and numbers. These findings will aid in you know, future lunar missions. Um, acknowledgements, shout out to my awesome mentors, Dr. Wool and Dr. Wiesner. Um, they've been amazing. They've been like just such good role models. They're so like just well-rounded people, um, always there to help. They really made this experience awesome. And I feel like I've learned more like here than I have in any semester in college. Um, I also want to give a quick acknowledgement to Matthew Hayes, who was my NCAS mentor uh, back in 2019. Thank you for offering to be like one of my references and helping me get into NASA and trying to prove myself here. So thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so we actually don't have time.